We're at DC Smith Greenhouse on the UW-Madison campus. It feels very tropical in here, very unlike a Wisconsin winter. But is it a sign of things to come? Welcome to the Wisconsin Gardener. I'm your host, Shelley Ryan. Today we focus on climate change for gardeners. We'll clarify the issues and destroy some myths. First, we meet with Michael Notero, Associate Director of the Center for Climatic Research in Madison, to look at the big picture. Then, a closer look at the latest USDA cold hardiness map shows that some changes have already happened in Wisconsin. Entomologist Phil Pelletieri shows how climate change can and will affect insects and insect populations, and how that will affect our gardens. Finally, climate change also means new weeds and stronger weeds, something to look forward to. It's all coming up on the Wisconsin Gardener. Funding for the Wisconsin Gardener is provided in part by the Wisconsin Master Gardener Association. Longenecker Gardens at UW-Madison Arboretum to talk about climate change, something that affects all of us. I am with Michael Notero, and Michael is the Associate Director at the Nelson Center for Climactic Research. And I said that right, right? Yes. And that's at part of the UW-Madison. Yes. Uh, and I think we should start by defining what climate change is. I've, you know, you hear everything from global warming to the new ice age, and it's something in between those two, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> the climate change is a better term than global warming because climate change really involves more than warming, but changes in weather patterns, changes in snow and ice, the entire system. So the patterns are changing. That's right. And we also want to differentiate between climate and weather. We can, as an example, this past winter of 2011-12, um, we had about six degrees above normal temperatures. March was about 14 degrees above normal. Um, so we have an extreme warm winter. And then we had an extreme drought in the summer of 2012. Those are examples of weather variability. Um, you can't necessarily point to those and say that's climate change. So those, those events may become more frequent with climate change. So, so that's they, the difference they, between events and actual climate change. So that event may become a more regular part of the pattern, but right now it's too soon to tell. That's right. And but you have some research to, that is kind of saying that we're going in that direction of warmer. That's right. We've had some studies such as Chris Kuchark and Sloan Serban did a study from 1950 to present looking at um, weather data throughout Wisconsin collected by residents of the state. And that's showing that um, the state has modestly warmed about 1.1 degrees since 1950s. Um, that small change has actually produced a substantial change in the growing season. It's lengthened it by a couple of weeks. So for us gardeners, that's, that's kind of a good thing. That's right. There are some good things and there's some bad things. Some of the other favorable things besides the warming is that it's gotten wetter, about three inches more rain a year, particularly in the autumn. Um, but then it's uh, associated with that, there's changes in weather extremes. We have the lengthening of the growing season by a, a month that's occurred. Um, that's been favorable. Well, and you said that there were some observations made by um, Aldo Leopold, in That's fact, right. that, that supports the climate change. Yes. Um, not only do we have the weather data, we have the impacts. Um, this is what's called phenology data, which is birds and plants timing spring events when they emerge. And uh, Aldo ne Leopold Bradley, back in the um, 30s and 40s, was collecting data on the timing of these events of birds and um, plant blooming in southern Wisconsin and later in the back of the 70s to 90s then his daughter Nina collected the same data in the same uh -huh. region and found that a lot of these events are occurring roughly three weeks earlier so it's already emerging and having effects on our so, so environment. You can look at that as some I mean it's still not a hundred year, years of, of data but you, you can say that yeah climate change is happening based on that kind of information? Yeah that information definitely supports it and I've also done a study on plant hardiness zones and the plant hardiness zones which you'll often see on the back of seed packets tell you what kind of plants will grow in an environment it's based on the coldest temperature of the year mm -hmm. and usually our plant hardiness zones range from 3b in northern Wisconsin to 5b around Milwaukee County um, we're projecting by the end of the century potentially that the um, Milwaukee County can even approach 7a category wow. which is more anywhere from central Illinois to 
um, central or northern Mississippi type plants. So in some ways this is a good thing because there's a lot more plants we can grow and grow them longer. But then I also think of certain plants like uh, peonies that need a cold, a uh, certain amount of cold to, to bloom, to grow. So we may lose some of the plants at the northern edge and, and then birches that are at its southern edge may retreat further north too. Yeah, so we can have substantial uh, changes in our gardens. And we know through the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, we've developed climate projections for our state, such as six degrees warming. Wow. And changes in weather extremes. Now the changes in weather extremes are the ones the gardeners you really have to be concerned about, such as- You can't predict them for one thing. That's right, <laughs> and they have large impacts on the garden. So the, gar the growing season might lengthen by a month, but we may have roughly three weeks more 90 degree days by the mid 21st century. Oh, I don't like that. That's right. <laughs> and more frequent summertime droughts and drier soils. So some of these can have direct effects on our garden. So we may have to mulch more often. Uh, we may have to plan for invasive species, which may spread in with warmer temperatures. And well, invasive species, I'm assuming uh, insects coming up from the south, probably new diseases as well. That's as right. this all That's right. So, so as, as gardeners, it sounds like we're gonna have to adapt. You mentioned mulching, more watering, being aware of these things coming up to, at us. Are there, are there other things we can do? That's right. With, in dealing with climate change, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts has really pushed adaptation, which is adjusting to the climate change, lessening negative effects by adapting to your um, change. There's also mitigation where you reduce emissions. In terms of adaptation, if you go to our website, we have some examples on how to adapt to climate change. So there are things to, we can do to, to help. That's right. We will have a direct link to your website. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Isn't this lush and tropical looking? It's not what Wisconsin looks like yet, and let's hope it's not gonna be that way for a while. We're at DC Smith Greenhouse on the UW-Madison campus, and I am with Dr. Laura Jull, Woody Ornamental Plant Specialist for the UW Extension. And uh, 2012 has been an exciting year for Woody plant lovers in, in many ways. Uh, we have a, a couple new things to talk about. Yeah, well, Shelly, we have a new USDA plant cold hardiness zone map. And this new map was put out by USDA Agriculture Research Service as well as Oregon State University. And it's based on 30 years worth of data. Um, it's more accurate than the previous yeah. map because there are more weather stations involved and throughout the country that were used, as well as it takes into account GIS technology and differences in elevation um, and grade changes. So it's a lot more accurate. You can actually type in your zip code and really? it will tell you specifically what your cold hardiness zone is for your area. Now that's kind of neat because I've always argued that I'm colder than Madison. Now I can actually look it up on the mm -hmm. map and prove it or mm -hmm. find out that I'm totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Now the biggest question is has this map changed from the previous one? Yes it has actually. In fact most of Wisconsin is one half cold hardiness zone warmer than Warm. what it was, yes. Okay. Um, previously, South Central Wisconsin was zone 4B. Now we're zone 5A. But I wouldn't run out to the store and try growing bananas in your yard. <laughs> well, would, would you take this as indication of climate change since it's over a 30 year period yeah, of studies? Yeah, I would. I mean, we're definitely getting warmer. There's no question about that. And we, as gardeners, we need to adjust accordingly. And selecting plants that are more heat tolerant as well as drought tolerant, um, as well as non-invasive and pest resistant is really important. And this year, I actually did my own personal evaluations of, and I was amazed at what plants really did well through this drought. So 20, the year of uh, the drought of 2012, we learned something good from? Yes, we actually <laughs> did. Uh, there are a number of plants that I saw that were very drought tolerant. Our, our some of our natives, like mm -hmm. uh, Calm St. John's wort, Hypericum, uh, the other one is aronia or choke oh. berry. Highly uh, ornamental and yes. edible. Um, yep. 
Uh, another one was our native eastern nine bark, especially the dwarf or purple leaf cultivars were mm -hmm. quite drought tolerant. Uh, Wygelia is another one that's not native, but it's uh, showed great drought tolerance as well, and a number of other plants. So, so in any case, uh, even though we're half zone warmer, you also said don't just run out and, and yeah. buy the first thing you see that's a, that's, you know, a half a zone warmer. Do some research, be intelligent. Um, it, something I hear again and again is also buy local. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of buying local from local nurseries or garden centers that either you know, grow their own plants or buy local plants and then re-sell um, them. I, I'm, some of the big box stores that I, I've actually been into are selling plants that really aren't cold hardy here. They actually have regional buyers and they buy for the entire Midwest. Well, the Midwest includes about four or five different cold hardy zones. Right, it's a, and it's so, a big area. Yeah, and so I always say buyer beware. Do some research on your own, um, looking plants up. But um, if you buy from a local nursery source, they know what's really hardy or not. Well, and even buying local, um, you talked about drought tolerant plants and some of these that are really drought tolerant. If we don't establish them well, they're still gonna just curl up and die. Oh yes, you have to make sh sure they're well established before they're truly drought tolerant. Even some of the most drought tolerant plants, if you don't water them the first couple years okay. on a regular basis, they will die. So a tree needs two or three years to get established, yeah, it's, then it can be drought tolerant. Yeah, it depends on the size of the tree you put in. They, in. For this part of the country, generally one inch caliper tree or the diameter of the tree when you plant it equals one year of uh, transplant uh, it needs to be able to establish. For shrubs, it's about the same, about two to three years. Okay, so and we'll have a list of these, these plants that you learned about in 2012, and so people need to remember to water and uh, let them get established and buy local. Absolutely. Just like we do with our food. Yep. Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. Plants and temperatures aren't the only things that uh, change as a result of climate change. Insects are going to become more interesting as the, the climate continues to change. We are at DC Smith Greenhouse at the Horticulture Building on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus on a very busy street corner. I am with UW Extension entomologist Phil Pelletieri and we're talking insects and climate change. Um, to, first, we should talk about the year 2012, which was kind of, we hope, an anomaly. And yet from what I hear, as c climate change continues, temperature extremes from horrendous rain to horrendous drought and high temperatures like we had in 2012 may become more normal, may become more frequent. And that, that caused some interesting issues with insects, didn't yeah, it? I, it was definitely, I, to be honest, the most ins insect specimens I've ever seen in a year in the lab. And the, the dynamics there, things started early. We had very strong southerly air flows. And so we had a month extra growing season, but really what was more interesting is what came up in the, in the, the spring winds. And so we saw a number of insects from down south, uh, insects that attack uh, Baptisia, it's called the Genista broom moth, and it turns out it's a Texas moth. It's something I from normally don't, don't normally see established up here. Uh, we had big flights of cutworms come up here. The other interesting thing is insects that we were used to having one generation a year tried a second generation, something like the squash vine borer, uh, took advantage of the longer growing season. So you see that short-term effect because of the dramatic changes and of course the drought. Um, lots of spider mites, things like false chinch bug. I haven't seen that insect since 1988. Wow. Uh, and it showed the last up. last drought. <laughs> right, you know, so the climate affected that. Uh, but what is kind of interesting is then looking at the longer term effects and, and that's somewhat different because uh, the dynamics there have more to do with the lack of cold weather in the winter and the kind of creatures that are, are doing quite well because of that. Well, curious then, some of these, cr uh, these critters that flew up because of climate change, they might be able to survive and stay here? Yeah, it depends on the critter. Uh, you know, some of them, you know, if you're normally established in Florida and can't get north of there normally, I, I don't think the we're, winters will take care okay. of those. Uh, but I think the dynamic we're seeing, and I, I tease sometimes the governor moved us to Missouri and didn't tell us, but uh, <laughs> the, the extended ranges of southern insects that normally were central Illinois now are well into the center part of Wisconsin. Okay. So I can give you some examples of that. Yeah. I mean, some of them are good. You know, it's oh, well, not that's everything's good to know. a pest. 
Um, <laughs> this creature is called a, a giant swallowtail. And giant swallowtails are endemic to Wisconsin. They breed on prickly ash, which we have quite a bit in the western edge of the state. But historically, if you got some decent cold weather in the winter, they didn't do very well. And so you might find some summers are very hard to find. Doesn't seem to be that way anymore. They really are quite common. And I equate it to basically the high survival rates of the chrysalises because of the lack of significant cold weather. So they're overwintering just fine. Just fine. And so, okay. the, you know, that's, that's kind of a fun one. Another one that really is kind of interesting to talk about are the praying mantids. Oh, and there are I no native mantids to Wisconsin. Years. And it turns out there's two exotic species. One's from China, the Chinese mantid, and one's from Europe called the, the European mantid. Oh. And they have one generation a year. And the way they try to get through the winter is as an egg case. And it looks a little bit like a golf ball. It's kind of spongy. And historically, why it could survive is they'd freeze out. Okay. And so we had no established populations until about the last 10 years. Now we know for a fact that we've got breeding populations in the southern third of the state and up in Door County. And wow. it's purely because they're surviving the winter. And the real reason behind that is the lack of 30 below and some of these other temperatures that really were quite commonplace at one time, but we just don't see them anymore. Well, and another neat new insect that you and I have talked about are the giant cicada killer wasps that look scarier than all get out, but aren't going to harm us. Right. And those were That's here. something that, again, I, as, as a, a young entomologist, it was something I'd find in Indianapolis, but you just barely saw any records here. And now they're so well established in, in the southern part of the state. In fact, we had, you know, in the past have done a, done a little piece on that, just kind of getting people used to what that, that creature stop, is about. So they stop running in terror because they're like about yay big. Right. Now, another interesting one to look at, there's an insect called the Euonymus caterpillar. Uh, it is a European insect, um, and it attacks burning bush and wahoo and other things in the genus Euonymus. Spring insect, um, it makes a lot of webbing. And the first records we had were in the 80s out of Waukesha. Uh, but what we would see if you had a significant cold snap in the winter, the little critters that overwinter as first instar larvae on the bark died. And okay. so I didn't see it move very Not much. Well, you get a couple much. mild winters and it'd get to Madison. I saw it north of the Dells. Four years ago, somebody sent me a picture from Duluth of a burning bush hedge totally stripped and defoliated. Wow. And so again, if that doesn't argue the lack of cold weather allowing insects to migrate farther north, uh, I mean, that's a classic example of that situation. Okay, I'm really happy now. Then I think I'm just going to keep moving as far north as I can go just to get rid of the insects. But you, you also have one you wanted to mention that's not tied in with climate change, but you kind of want people to be on the lookout for. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the next big pest critter is something called a marmorated stink bug. And it's a brown stink bug. And what's confusing is we have native brown stink bugs here already. I was going to say, I've seen this. Yeah. Now, this I thing, haven't seen this one. Well, uh, hopefully not. <laughs> um, we have some small records of overwintering adults in three or four counties. But if you look what's happened out east, um, it has become a major pest from two directions. One, it is a major pest of fruits and vegetables where its feeding causes distortions and callousing and oh, great. In, in abortions of fruit, all kinds of things. But then the adults in the fall invades people's houses like Asian lady beetle has done in the past. And oh, so really great. that combination makes it a superstar and a super pest. And, and unfortunately, we expect this to continue to be more commonplace. It may take a few years to get to the levels that's been out in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, but it's coming. So a lot of things are coming, some good like the praying mantids, a lot not so great. So we just need to be on the lookout and, and be prepared. Yeah, and again, sometimes you, you kind of pretend that you moved 500 miles south because that's really what's starting to happen with the insect population. Great, so we can go swimming in November. Not. <laughs> okay, thanks, Phil. <laughs> We are at the UW-Madison Arboretum, probably not in one of their favorite spots because we are surrounded by a Canada thistle. And I am with Extension Weed Specialist Mark Renz to talk about Canada thistle and why it seems to be one of the few things that's happy about climate change. <laughs> yeah, this plant is really truly a, a unique plant. You know, not many people get excited about weeds, but I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, this is not thrilling me here. Yeah, and, and this plant is, is one of the few plants we actually know a lot of information about how climate change has already affected it and probably will affect it in the future. What's really unique about this plant is that what 
research has been done is documented that as CO2 levels increase, we're getting more above ground growth and below ground growth, so more shoots and roots. Oh, goody. Yeah, and so that's really the problem is, is so uh, in addition, that research has looked at management. It looks like management is going to become more difficult because of more shoot and more root growth. Well, I know that uh, standard practice is, is, you know, roundup for many people because this is just a real bear to get rid of. Yeah, and actually that's what the research evaluated was the use of glyphosate as the active ingredient in Roundup. And what they found is that it was less effective at controlling the plant. What it did is it killed the same amount of root tissue as it typically would, but there was just so much more root, so tissue. Much more root tissue, exactly. So more of the plant, less effective. What does that do for, for organic gardeners who are trying to, I assume, just pull it? Yep, so they're left with pulling, mechanical management, physical management, mowing, and it's really difficult, really a struggle. A lot of our organic growers, and I know of one or two that's actually gone out of business because of canned thistle, because wow. it's so difficult to manage. We don't recommend composting it, which many of them try to do, because this perennial root that we're holding in our hands here can actually re-sprout and re-root and cause an invasion uh, in that population to exist. So really a difficult plant to manage. We know it's a problem in urban areas as well as ag lands and also natural areas like this. Like so this. truly a problem. Just about everywhere. Yep. Well, and are there other weeds that are happy about climate change? Yeah, a lot of our weeds unfortunately are going to probably do better from climate change. I think two that I'd like to highlight would be garlic mustard and wild parsnip. Oh, great. You know, we've recently we've had an early warm up in the spring, some really erratic behavior, and it seems like garlic mustard really took advantage of that. Populations just blossomed this year. It's really dominant in the south. We're gonna, it's spreading north. It's probably gonna spread even farther to the north. We're seeing it in full sun habitats where we haven't seen oh, it in those areas right. in the past. It used to be shade mostly. Yeah, and so we're really concerned about that one. Wild parsnip is another one that's spreading rapidly in the east and the north. We know this well from the south. So we're really gonna need to be on the lookout. Those are probably gonna be players that, in the future. Uh, what about buckthorn? That's one that I, is a pain. Yeah, buckthorn, I kind of say, we already lost the war on <laughs> right. that one too. It really has these huge massive thickets. There are a couple areas that are re relatively free of buckthorn, but that one really does well in our environment. It's up north of us and so, and to the south of us, so I predict it's probably gonna to continue to really thrive as our climate changes. So you guys are gonna to have to change your maps entirely, basically, because everything's gonna spread. Right, and that's one of our concerns. When our lab, one of the things we do is we do predictive modeling to predict where these spread. And one of the big tools we look at is how the climate ch is, but as that climate exactly. changes, we're gonna to have to redo all our maps. And so that's oh. a lot more work we're gonna to have to do too. <laughs> well, are there, these are weeds that are already here in Wisconsin and most of us are somewhat familiar with some of these. Yeah. Are there new weeds that we might not even know are coming? Yeah, there's actually two I wanna highlight. We're most concerned about the weeds coming from the south. We mm -hmm. get them from the north and the south usually. From the south, the, um, the first one that we're concerned about is a plant called kudzu or the, or the weed or plant that ate the south. Heard of it, yes. <laughs> it's, it's relatively close to the Wisconsin border and really? just south of Chicago. And so we're concerned about it moving in there. It's been documented in Canada as well wow. to the south of us. So it's probably a matter of time before we get that one. We're really actively looking for that to try and find it. And you said two. Yeah, and then the other one we're concerned about is a plant called Japanese stiltgrass. It's an annual grass like crabgrass in our gardens, but instead of growing in full sun, grows in shaded conditions like understories of forests and creates a canopy of just grass in that understory, displacing the native plants. Animals don't like it and don't do as well in that habitat and also is changing the soil ecosystem and potentially the fire uh, disturbance regime. So increase of fire is because of this dry grass as an under is an understory yep. basically. Yep, so it dries out right about now mm. and much more fuel than would typically be in many of our systems and so we might get that, that those forests burning much more frequently than so, in the past. All sorts of problems. Yep. So so what do we do? I mean, I'm hearing gloom and doom. Is there anything we as, as gardeners and homeowners can do? I think there are and I think the, the, the two points I'd like to point out is one, educate yourself. Okay, we have know, know your enemy. That's right, we have lots of resources and Extension and DNR and others have lots of resources to help with identification. And we'll have a link to your website to help Great. with that. That would be wonderful. So know what those are. And then if you think you might see something, tell someone. Okay, I don't, care if it's don't a keep it a secret. That's right, I don't care if it's a county <laughs> agent, someone from DNR, some other person that can get the word out so we can go in and try and conduct some management on an early detection basis. And if you're wrong, that's okay. We'd rather have uh, that information be wrong than have you not share that information. With rather us. than have kudzu be the vine that ate the north. Exactly. Thanks, Mark. Sure, my pleasure.
We'll have more information as well as the new cold hardiness map on our website. Just go to WPT.org, then click on the Wisconsin Gardener. I'm Shelley Ryan. Thanks very, very much for watching the Wisconsin Gardener. Funding for the Wisconsin Gardener is provided in part by the Wisconsin Master Gardener Association.